It says you're live. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> Thank you, John. As always, always right on top of things for me. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another fantastic virtual tasting with Becker Vineyards. Uh, my name is Rebecca Nelson. I'm the wine club director at Becker Vineyards, and I'm really excited for tonight because we're trying wine club member wines. So we have the standard Becker Vineyards uh, May 2021 wine club shipment that we're tasting through tonight. We have our 2018 Jolie Rosé, which is a brand new release. We have the 2015 Prairie Roti, which is a fantastic red blend. And then we also have another brand new release, our 2018 Cabernet Sauvignon Reserve uh, from the Wilmoth Family Vineyard. So two brand new releases we're going through tonight. I think it's going to be a fabulous tasting. I am joined by Kaylin Hall, of course, here on the same screen. And then with us, as always, is our owner and proprietor, uh, Dr. Richard Becker. And of course, the guy who's always on, John Leahy, our, our winemaker. <laughs> so let's get going, guys. Let's taste through these wines. Jolie first. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Thanks for that intro, Rebecca. And I didn't know until today I didn't have to do these. <laughs> so, oh, <clears throat> we've already got a few people. So Sally and Susan, welcome. Early birds. And then uh, Doc, would you like to, uh, to a few words of introduction? Just a, again, a moment uh, to remember uh, at 55 or 56 weeks in a row while we're here, and it's because of the pandemic and lots of good news, good signs, uh, a decrease uh, in, in um, new cases and hospitalizations in, in all states, interestingly, but still lots of deaths. And uh, this is the absolute moment to press on with, you know, to get uh, vaccinated and get this, get this out of our lives. Anyway, uh, Salute to all the people who are fighting, still fighting this. They they have not quit, and uh, we owe we owe everything to them. And in, in addition to that, we're going to taste some nice wine. I love this this lineup. It's going to be fun. Well, I I will second that. We are going to taste a few good wines. So, and one of my favorite uh, Facebook people is on a lady by the name of Kate Nelson. Oh, hi, and, mom. Morning. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, here we go. We're getting a lot of people coming on. Teresa, welcome, Betty. So let's everybody pour a glass of this beautiful Jolie because <clears throat> I really want to get into the composition of it. I, I, we were reading it earlier and it's kind of funny, but you just give it a swirl, a sniff and a taste. And then uh, Kaylin, you want to lead us off with your impressions? Okay. <laughs> um, so this Jolie, I'm excited to get into um, in comparison to the previous vintage, I prefer this one. This tends to be a bit more fruit forward in my opinion. Um, lots of bright red fruit, cherry, um, almost some tart cranberry flavors as well. It's just beautiful. Um, there is a hint of floral. Um, I can't quite nail down, maybe like apple blossom, something along those lines. Um, but I think it's just a beautiful little wine. Um, and it's a bit fuller body than I think the previous vintage. And I do appreciate that as well. Um, I'm always looking for um, a beautiful rosé to enjoy in the summertime in lieu of red wine because red wine and, and I don't mix in the heat. And so this, I think, is going to be my answer. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's an answer to a, a very good question. <laughs> or I should say a great answer to a good question. Uh, so <clears throat> just so not to confuse you guys, later on, I'm going to ask you what food to pair with this wine. So <laughs> It's something new. We've it. never heard. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Doc, rosés, your impression, oh. why do you like them and why do we have three of them at the winery? Well, uh, you're, you could, uh, you could, you'll be the better person to answer that last question, but uh, you know, I think rosé is just a wonderful, wonderful way to treat wine grapes and it's an, it's an old idea. You know, uh, the first wines were rosés in which reds and whites were planted together in the field and when they harvested um, the grapes, they they got a, a much lighter wine, uh, a, ray, a rosé. That's ancient, and uh, but you have to remember that we didn't start trellising vineyards until 1900. Prior to 1900, they were allowed to grow in trees. They were bushes, um, and all all the separation and segregation was not not so well known as it is now. That's the second. <clears throat> but always, uh, I remember going in a uh, in a in a in a little. Uh, a, public uh, uh, place for releasing wines near Avignon uh, where they had uh, on the wall, they had gasoline pumps. They had 
under one they had white, another had red, and another had rosé. And you came in with your container and it was weighed, and then they got the gasoline pump and filled it up with rosé and uh, and weighed it again, and you got charged. Uh, and it was a uh, the French were in line to to to, uh, to get filled up with the rosé. It was summer. It was 100 degrees outside, and uh, it was it was a great wine. Loves well, to be chilled. Yeah, if they're pumping that wine out of gasoline pumps, that explains why they make such small cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're going to electric, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, I can Okay, um, Rebecca, we're waiting for your impressions of the wine. Okay, so... I agree with Kaylin that there's some floral notes on this and I'm almost thinking it might be a little bit of rose petal is what I'm kind of picking up on the nose. And then I also, as well as the, the cherry and, and the bright fruit, I'm getting, and the cranberry, I'm actually getting some watermelon on, on the palette on this one. Okay. I really love the color of this particular rose. It's got a really, uh, it, it's a deeper, it's weird, it's deeper but it's also brighter. I don't know how to explain that than the previous vintage. Um, and I, I just really love the color of, of this particular rosé, but I think it speaks to the composition, which I really think, John, you should get into because it's pretty ridiculous. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is ridiculous. So I, I want to add one thing, and that is what we were driving around in the, the Rhone Valley uh, 30 years ago. This was before people drank water. <laughs> and, uh, and not not even all cars were in it, so we're, 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 uh, have air conditioned. And so I remember we stopped at a restaurant, and they brought out a little a chilled uh, a carafe, stone carafe full of uh, rosé. And you thought that's why they made rosé because no, nobody had a water bottle. Imagine life without five or six water bottles around you at all times. Well, that's the way the world was in those days when you were in grade school, John, and uh, mm -hmm. the rest of us. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. But yeah. uh, why drink water? That's the, well, why drink water is the real question. What? You mean what not everybody went to, went to Irish daycare? <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of the plastic water bottles and, uh, and buy a bottle of rosé. Is what I think. You know, it's I agree. With this. Straightforward. <clears throat> yeah. The other thing, Doc, about not having a lot of glass is we can no longer find that polished glass pieces washing up on the beach. No, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, besides the fact that apparently the French don't drink water. <laughs> not that I've ever seen. Um, certainly not at a meal. Can you imagine a glass of water on the table? I mean, it's ridiculous. No, no. yeah. <clears throat> I come to think of it, uh, Rebecca, did there was no water at that restaurant, was there? Yeah. That we had that lunch? I don't, I don't think there was. Huh. That is have to ask for water. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to get into the composition a little bit, and then I'll go back to this wine and and some of the reasons we do have three rosés. Um, but first of all, um, the uh, Debbie Watson just uh, cheered us and said that they're really close to the winery. They're no longer in Weatherford. They're in Stonewall. Debbie, um, we need to close the winery. So if you could skedaddle over there and help us clean up. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Um, so in the Jolie, wait for it, 22% Cabernet, 15% Malbec, 14% Merlot, 11% Tempranillo, 10% Petit Verdot, 8% Petit Syrah, 7% Zinfandel, 5% Cabernet Franc, 4% Dolcetto, 3% Grenache, and 1% Cinso. Wow. Yeah. I don't think those numbers are random. I mean, uh, really carefully arrived at. They they are. I was really inspired by this Christmas song called "The Twelve Days of Christmas." <laughs> <You're> Eleven. <laughs> hey, <clears throat> Doc, how do you know? How do you know a joke is a dad joke? I'm afraid to find out. It's a parent. <laughs> I'm going to tell that to my grandchildren. Yeah. They, they like it. Exactly. And Kaylin, I've been telling your joke to everybody. But giving you credit. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Dad does okay. the best. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to ask you guys again think about food for just rose. I because the reds will be able to inter, interplay. But I, I do want you here in a few minutes. We're going to come up with food just for the rose. 
One thing I do want to ask, when do you enjoy rosé the most? Rebecca, what circumstance do you enjoy rosé the most? I think this is tough. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy rosé a lot of times. <laughs> I, I, it's going to be a tie. Sorry, John. It just has to be. I can't only pick one. It's a tie between sitting outside on a beautiful, you know, spring, almost summer day when it's like 80, 85 degrees and having a glass of rosé and at Thanksgiving because I love this rosé with Thanksgiving and both of those I feel like are really great and social, which we're all just really craving right now sure. experiences. And I, I really, those are my two favorite times to have rosé in particular this rosé. Okay. Kaylin, what circumstances do you like to have rosé? And Absolutely. remember your mom's watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, she, would, she loves to drink rosé with me. So we're good yeah. there. You're good um, there. Yeah. Uh, but realistically, I enjoy rosé the most, I think, whenever I'm preparing dinner, especially um, having people over back when I used to do that. Um, when I'm cooking dinner and we're all mingling and, you know, snacking and all of that, I think that is my favorite time for rosé. It's a great okay. social wine. <laughs> it really is. Right on. Doc, is there any particular time that you, you your automatic go-to is a rosé? Uh, you know, I, I think the food makes a difference, and I, I, I agree. Uh, I think uh, uh, certainly with some cheese and uh, certainly in a, on a hot day with sandwiches or something outside, kind of a, certainly at a picnic would be wonderful. Um, it's, here's a, let me just present this to... <laughs> it's the Yay! elusive Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> I'm gonna try some. Your presence was requested, Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, you, you you look like you are the uh, CEO of a public uh, of a publication empire. You know, holler. <laughs> the... Well, I meant to ask. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yum yum, delish. Yep. I like yep. this on the porch. Just like it on went. The on the porch. Yeah. On the porch? Yeah. Yep. On the porch. Especially good with mosquitoes. <laughs> you know, with Texas mosquitoes, they're awesome. You know, especially the ones that cast a shadow as they fly over the glass. Those are my favorite mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Me, I um I like rose in a frozen bottle down by the pool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, the, we have these little stainless steel wine bottles that you put in the freezer and then you just open the bottle, pour it in there and then bring the bottle with you. It keeps the, the wine at serving temperature for about four hours. So it's the perfect amount of time for a bottle of rosé at the pool for one person. No. <laughs> four hours seems like a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <Stop one. it. laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think uh, rosé, I, to me, what I'm leaning towards is rosé is much more social wine. I really think that a lot of people will easily go to a glass of rosé when it's mostly about the people and not so much about the, the food. Exception being in our household too, uh, Rebecca is, is Thanksgiving. Uh, it certainly is a, is a great wine for that. But I just think of it as a social wine. Mm -hmm. so, I will I say that at many of the events that we used to have, um, when we would have welcome receptions and things like that, people would come up and be like, oh, well, what wines are options? And you begin to list things off and people are like, Ooh. and rosé is a very popular option just because you get to kind of walk that middle line and um, it's going to be palatable to most guests and um, also refreshing. Like it's, it's something that's not going to harm your palate for the next wine um, or for whatever hors d'oeuvres are available. Mm -hmm. So this is the bottle that I speak of. Yes. You see, and these are great because they just, they're double in wall insulated. It's perfect yep. carrying. So you can just put the bottle in there and carry it with you. John, yep. were you in a previous life, were you on the Price is Right? Were you one of the models on <laughs> Secretly, I'm Vanna White. <laughs> uh, can't you tell from my fashion sense? Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. So, uh, oh, Belinda says she has one of those bottles. 
you uh -huh. right. I have a few of them, and I, I have one that's uh, 1.5 liter, which is really great when you want to take two bottles of rosé down to the pool. Rosé. Ah, I'll have to try that. But uh, if you want a bottle, you'll have to come down to the winery, make an appointment to come in and have a glass of wine with us, and the bottles are there for purchase. So, all right, are we ready to go on to the next wine? Yeah. All right, Doc, you. would you lead us off with the Prairie Rotique? Because this, and we've had this a couple of times in the past year, but I don't think we ever got into the real story behind the name Prairie Roti. We alluded to it, but would you uh, mind giving us the, a little background on why the name? Well, I think the name, of course, the name comes from Coat Roti, which uh, refers to the uh, roasted uh, sundered slope of the Rhone River, coat meaning shoulder or slope. And um, the, uh, the Bird Dallas doesn't have a steep bank. So we thought instead of Sundridge Shoulder, we would call it the Sundridge Prairie or Prairie Roti. And, um, and it, was, it was certainly to include, uh, uh, with I guess varying amounts of focus, uh, uh, Rhone, Rhone grapes uh, like Mubin and Carignan and Syrah. And so that's, that's where this has come from. And, uh, I think you, I love the way you've blended other components in to, to increase the, the aromatic and the, and the mouthfeel, the structure. Uh, and this wine is quite wonderful. Uh, I love it. It's yeah, I, a lot of love. I think it deserves it. Well, and it, it's definitely at that age where it needs to be decanted. When you have this bottle, you need to open it up at least an hour, hour and a half before service. So you really should, uh, to do it justice, decant it for a while. Mine has been open now, unfortunately, only for about 45 minutes, almost an hour. It's just kind of coming into its own aromatically. Uh -huh. <laughs> this, um, I do you get a lot of graphite or, or you know? I do, yeah. yes, uh -huh. yes. Okay, Kaylin, what do you think? Well, I've got it in two different glasses. Um, I've got it in our Becker Vineyards logoed uh, um, glass and then also a uh, Syrah glass mm -hmm. and it's interesting how different it smells out of each. I would say that we've had, had ours open maybe for um, 45 minutes or so. It's been, it's been about an hour. About an hour. Yeah. Um, and on the nose of each um, they vary. So for the Syrah glass I'm getting just coffee outright. Mm -hmm. um, on, on the standard Becker Beater Stacey glass I'm getting more um, fruit components to it, maybe a bit of uh, like dried cherry, dried cranberry. It's still very um, bright um, and the same on the palate. And it's just interesting to sit side by side and compare them and see the differences that I'm picking up on each. And it's different on the palate of each. And so I'm, I'm in my own tasting world here. So that's perfect. No, that's, <laughs> but I think that's what we're doing too. We're trying to encourage people to taste, but you know, we're giving our opinion, what we, we think we taste and what we do, you know, what, what it is, the components, it's hard to suss out. And I think the hardest question that anybody asks when they're just starting to get into wine is what am I tasting? And I'm like, I, I, I wish I, I knew, uh, but um, the, I, I try not to be a smart aleck with that question. Um, it's really hard not to be a smart aleck with that question. But the, the idea here is you start off with whether you like it or not, let's get that simple. Is this something that I find enjoyable? That's where you start. Is it a new varietal, a varietal you haven't tried? Let's say you've never had a Merlot before. It's the first Merlot. Let's say you don't care for it necessarily, and you, but you don't know why you don't like it. The thing I tell people to do is go find three more Merlots done by three different producers and try those before you make up your mind. Try Merlot as a varietal across the board and see what it is you like or don't like. That's what we do in the winery. That's how you train in your palate that's, you know, you, you taste, you have to get familiar with what the wine is, what a good example is, what a poor example is, and you'll find those along the way. But at the end of the day, at the very end of the day, the only thing that matters is do I like it? Do I want another glass? Those two questions, if you can answer that, then buy the bottle and enjoy it, you know, with or without the pool. So <laughs> I don't know why you do it without the pool, but that's beside the point. <laughs> So Margaret, what are your impressions of the Prairie Roti, ma'am? Well, first I must say that I love it. Mm -hmm. And I find that this is a wine that you could um, 
have with many different foods. You know, it would be, um, I think it, it's light enough that it can go easily with all the um, cheeses and different um, snacky type foods. But I could also, this is another one. I could just watch a sunset with this, you know? Yeah. I love, it's light, it's airy, it's clean tasting, it's rich. I think it's wonderful. Yeah. I think, Margaret, I think the word rich that you hit on is really important. I've been tasting this and, and that's something that I'm getting. It, it is lighter in body, but it has this depth that I think is really, really intriguing and really great. And one of the things I told Kaylin that I'm getting on the palate, which I know sounds crazy, but it's almost like a, a meatiness, it's almost like a mincemeat yeah. sort of a flavor that I'm really enjoying uh, on the palate and out of, out of either glass. I think it's, it's a really great wine. The, I, you know, the, the richness and Kaylin, you were talking about, um, or is it you, Rebecca, coffee coming out strong on the nose, coffee? Yeah. I know it's hard to tell us apart. We wore different hair this week. We tried. You got, yeah, that was a cool one, but it was kind of confusing. I was expecting, I told my left or right side ponytail that, that <laughs> you took that away. Um, <laughs> you're just confusing me now, um, which is not hard to do. <laughs> uh oh, I'm spilling wine on my brand new oiled bar. Um, uh -oh. That's okay. Three coats of tongue oil down, and I think it'll be okay. Um, what I find really interesting about this wine is how it does uh, transform in the glass after decanting. That coffee, which I, th I think is graphene or graphite early on, starts to deepen. You know, you get those cedar shaving notes, but then it goes into that more herbaceousness. That's when I start to see the coffee and the chocolate come out more uh, with the air interplay. That's oh, just a wonderful wine. Um, Oh, and Susan Hanks adds, another thing I've learned doing these tastings, try more than one. Jolie, the reason I now love rosé. <laughs> uh, interesting. Oh, yeah. nice. And Ann, <laughs> uh, Wool, Ann Woolweaver is agreeing with you about the glasses. Uh, she says it's amazing how the glass can change not only the smell, but the taste of wine. And you're absolutely right, Ann, it, it can. And, and Rebecca, when, uh, when we fire back up in full bore this summer, um, we are going to get back into our our Riedel tastings, and I think that'll be a lot of fun, especially if you've been following along. It'll be fun to come, to come to the winery and do one. Um, I think it'll be yeah. great. And Jet is on, so we need to be really, really <gasps> nice about the third one. <laughs> okay, so the Prairie Roti composition, which is also kind of a fun one. Um, I don't know what I was thinking back in 2017, but apparently it was a good day. Uh, <laughs> it, well, that's when we, we put the blend together, wasn't it? 2017. 37% uh, Merlot, 24% Moved, 22% Carignan, 9% Barbera, 4% Cabernet Sauvignon, and 4% Petite Syrah. That six different varietals? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm going off the breakdown of the winemaker's blending notes. So, um, you know, and plus Rachel's not here to correct me, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> Don't worry, she'll send me a text if you're wrong. <laughs> oh, that's a beautiful wine. I this one has, a little, we're talking about lightness and, and richness and, and, and body, and, and this has a little bit of, uh, I think, if I'm thinking about the best wines I've ever tasted uh, in my life, they always have a, a kind, of, kind of a mix of lightness, uh, of light notes, uh, kind of unexpectedly delicate, and then a, then an incredibly warm, uh, an incredibly dense, rich kind of body and finish. And uh, and this has some of that. Um, you know, I've tasted old Burgundies from you know the 50s and, and even from the 20s. And when you first look at them, they're very light and they are very uh, uh, kind of kind of delicate. And then when you when you when you swallow them, they have this incredibly rich finish, and uh, this is in that direction. This very much would like would like some food with it. I think yeah. oh, gee. I agree. It needs hazelnut chocolate. Yeah, yeah no pecans. think about wines that are, that are not wines can be powerful, but not all that good. Like like a, something that's all to not, or something that's. Uh, 
just it's kind of one it's like a bass note on a on the wash tub it's just a thunk uh it could be a loud thunk but this has complexity i guess that's what i'm trying to what i'm searching for so which i really like. i do i agree with you it does have a nice complexity but i want to reference back to the chocolate trying a little chocolate um rebecca you can't tell jody that i've hidden all the chocolate in the bar <laughs> i will <laughs> On one condition that you bring them to me and share. It's <laughs> probably <laughs> <Right> gone. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> okay. Any other any other thoughts on the Prairie Road tea? Well, one of the things that we have to mention about this wine, it is a 2015, and so it has gone to a lot of competitions and it's also won a plethora of medals. And since our other two wines that we're tasting are brand new releases and have not yet been submitted, I think we absolutely need to acknowledge that this one has has definitely made the rounds and gotten lots of the medals. So this got uh, at the 2019 Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo International Wine Competition. It got gold, class champion, and Texas class champion. Uh, at the 2019 San Francisco Chronicle, it got a silver at the 2019 Lone Star International, it won best in category and a gold medal. I mean, this wine is, has done tremendously in, in uh, competitions as well. So mm -hmm. it's not just us that we love it, but I also think that being that it is an older vintage, it's just going to show you that it, it is going to age really nicely. Um, and I really love how it's developing. You know, we're, we're still serving this in the tasting room and it's one of those wines that you don't see a lot of 2015 vintages from us in the tasting room. And this one just continues to surprise and is just doing really, really well every year. We're like, oh, should we keep it out or, or should we take it away? And it's like, no, it, it tastes fantastic. It tastes fantastic. Let's keep doing it. So yep. I think it's worth hey, John, John, the, Thank you. This one, is, this one's evolved a lot over the last six years. It has. You think? When you first it has. It's not here. It's not like that. <laughs> Well, I think it's also a wine that that proves that Texas has the ability to grow world class wine and age world class wine. That, that we can um, we can compete. In my mind, I don't see why we're we're not competing more other than just sheer volume of, of growth. Um, you know that we don't have a whole lot. We've got twelve thousand acres in the state, but um, of those eight, of those twelve thousand, a majority of them are premium fruit, which is really nice. So we, we're starting to come into our own, I think. Um, and I think we've proven that. This wine certainly has given it a run for the money. Uh, you know, I'm not saying we're the only winery that can do this. There are other fantastic winemakers out there and other people doing really good things. It's just we're the best. Um, the <laughs> but <clears throat> I'm not allowed to be a little arrogant with my chocolate and wine. <laughs> uh, sounds wonderful. Yeah, no, we- uh, Taylor, is it possible to send Jen a, a link? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. See if you'll join us. Oh, hey, Jen. I hope you're around. <laughs> yeah, because it uh, we're, we're coming up on his wine. That's right. Okay, Gary Clark asked, John, can you describe uh, your, your new background that we haven't seen before? Yes, Gary, I can. It's called a bar. <laughs> now, when you're Irish, you grow up with them. <laughs> so, yeah. Nope, this is in the bar in my uh, dining room, Gary. So... Uh, unfortunately, I'd show you the rest of the dining room, but I think it would end in divorce court because it's an entire uh, area. It's still being painted and remodeled, and um, I'm not supposed to show off all of the mess. So mm -hmm. we'll just have to deal with the background here. It's but I'm very proud of it because I've been I've been doing tongue oil with citrus oil, so real 100% tongue, tongue oil mixed with orange oil to penetrate the wood. So I've got birch tops on the bars with uh, French oh. oak uh, siding edging. And the, the French oaks are old uh, uh, wine staves. So they're dark and they're black. And I sanded them down to, with uh, 200 grit. And then I went through with the oil. And then I started wet sanding with 400 grit in between each oil coat to get them really smooth. So show, far, show, us, with the, pardon? show us with the camera. Put the camera on the bar. We want to see. Yeah. Sure. How about this? You see the bar? <laughs> it is a beautiful bar. Is this? Is this like this old house, is this, is that what this is? Well, and, and then this is, is the, the shelving that I'm particularly proud of with the chocolate. <laughs> I see where it is, right? Now we know where it is. Yeah, exactly. Now you don't know where the rest of it is. <laughs> it's in the cupboard with the acid phosphate. 
That's the place where I keep my chocolate as well. I, no bar is complete unless you can make an old fashioned egg cream or a chocolate phosphate. So I'm just saying, yeah. And for those of you who may remember a soda fountain, I can actually make them. So, <laughs> okay. Is Jet gonna join us or is he able to? I don't know. We sent him an invite. We'll see. Okay. All right. Here, what time does the party start? It's already started, Gary. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, in the meantime, while you're monitoring that, shall we give a swirl, a sniff, and a taste on the uh, 2018 Wilmoth? Yeah. So um, this all went out to the wine club. Could you talk about the, the ship shipment and wine club and everything, Rebecca, a little bit? You plug it. I know. Really so good. Good. Um, sorry. <laughs> so I, I love getting to be involved in the, in the discussion um, about which wines we're including, because it also means that I get to find out what new wines are coming through the pipeline. And so from time to time, there are new wines that come through the pipeline and they're like, no, we're not going to include that yet. We're holding that back. And then there are, there are times where they come through the pipeline. I'm like, no, we have to get that out. And and one of those, well, actually two of those are in the shipment. The Jolie is always one that I love to include in the main shipment. And then having a new vintage of, of one of our single vineyard designated cabs is always one where I'm chomping at the bit to get it out. So I was really, really excited for this one to be released. Um, and those are, and those are always just so glorious. You know, we have multiple vintages of this. We've done a lot of verticals with the Wilmoth and with the Canada and, and with all of these. And so every single vintage, I'm just excited to see what comes next, what comes from this year. Um, and so honestly, I'm trying to remember 2018 and I really can't remember much about 2018. So I'm gonna want you, John, to remind us of what happened that growing season and, and why this tastes the way that it does. But yeah. I love that it, it gives you that um, understanding that weather makes a huge difference. And so the same grapes from the same soil made by the same winemaker, and they taste dramatically different from year to year. And I really, really love that experience. And I, I think that's a, a great thing about wine. Um, and so sharing that with the wine, wine club members, I think is always important and, and getting them to, to see this new vintage while we actually still have, you know, had some of the 17 there for a while, there was a bit of an overlap and so I think that that's a really great, great thing for them to get to experience as well. I think, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, being able to do verticals, first of all, and, and that's the beautiful thing about being able to build up with, especially Jet and the Canada family vineyards both. But um, 2018, I, I will get to the weather and I will get to the difference in the growing season. But Doc, what are your impressions of the 18? Well, then, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful fruit, kind of a balance of tannins and, <clears throat> kind of cinnamon and uh, you know this is this wine is very very early in its course and it'll be fun to watch its, its uh, evolution but uh, it has uh, just just nice complexity both on the nose and the palate I think yeah it's <clears throat> part of it possibly yeah yeah because we just we just released it you know we bottled it a while back you know after two years of barrel um, so it is a very young wine. <clears throat> and I think, um, I think some of the uh, mistakes people look at, they'll look at wines and they'll be like, oh, this is like a four or five year old label on the shelf at their favorite shop. You know, maybe we should go over something younger. It's not necessarily the case. It, you know, take the risk. And I think the older, especially with Cabernet, the older the vintage, I think you'll find a maturity that you may really enjoy. I happen to really enjoy young Cabernets for the fact that they're more fruit forward they come across slightly lighter in body. They will deepen. Those tannins will form longer, longer chains. Those structures will change over the years. They will deepen. The notes will deepen, and, and so will the, the body. Um, the amount of glycerol won't deepen too much, and that's this. This has got a medium amount of glycerol in it compared to the 17. I think the biggest difference you're talking about, Rebecca, the difference in the years is the uh, just literally the weight of the grape uh, post fermentation, the weight of the wine. For me, um, that's the biggest tell difference in 17, a fully, truly, really uber ripe year. 18, we got ripe, but we did not have the same weather that we enjoyed in 17. So we don't enjoy the same structural mass 
in the wine that we do in the 17. Um, we did a batonnage on the barrels, uh, which is a process after the wine is done with primary fermentation and we're waiting for the malactic fermentation to, to kick off and go, we stir the barrels up. Um, some people do it daily, some people do it a couple times a week. Uh, you stir the barrel, there's a barrel stirring rod, you get in there and it just disturbs the leaves, rolls them back up into suspension. That helps build body and mouthfeel, the glycerol that develops as a byproduct of the yeast. Uh, and it's very, very important, uh, especially in red wines, heavier weighted red wines, something with a good extraction you, you know, naturally has a lot of glycerol. There are certain yeasts that will produce more or less, depending on what you want to do. And the yeast strain and varietal is very important. Um, the non-saccharomyces yeast that you use too for the bacterial fermentation uh, is extraordinarily important as well. So, you know, you're using a fungus and a bacteria to make a beautiful um, beverage. So, <laughs> which is my favorite thing in the world because I like to say, oh yes, I have bacteria and I have fungus. Which one would you like? Thanks, Doc. <laughs> Well, would you uh, care to uh, give us the dissertation on Malades <laughs> and the origin? Okay. Yes, the origin of the term malady. Malady. Yes, the sickness well, and yeah, yeah. Well, it was originally yeah, it was uh, it means sick basically, but the uh, the wines were considered sick uh, when they had an off taste or an off off aroma, and uh, so the Pasteur who was a chemist was looking at the wines. Uh, uh, that his neighbors were bringing. Actually, I've been in his laboratory uh, in France, and it's amazing to see his microscope and um, the, 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 the sort, of, sort of containers he used to study the wines, the, the, the vials and flasks. And uh, he um, and he recognized that uh, with his microscope that there were things growing in the in the wine that, or there were things present in the wine. I don't think he knew they were growing. They weren't there when the wines smelled good and tasted good. And so he, so that, that was the origin of the germ theory of disease. And um, so wines that were considered uh, infirm or, or had a malady, uh, those, those expressions were then applied, also came from humans, but this connection between uh, microorganisms in the wine and then microorganisms in the body fluids of people who were ill, uh, he tied together at about 1860. Before that, we didn't know the germ theory of disease didn't exist, and uh, it's you know imagine that was not that long ago. That was right. you know, a couple well, ancestors ago. So. And his his laboratory happens to be in the heart of one of my favorite wine regions in in France, the Jura. Uh, yeah, both, yeah. yeah, yeah. So both that, I really want to go. Yeah, I think. Hey, what are you doing next weekend? No. <laughs> <laughs> This is what France will let me do. I mean. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I take it Jet won't be able to join us. He hasn't responded. He hasn't okay. responded. All right, guys. It better up. See what pajamas, tell me what to see what his pajamas look like. You know, it's late. It's dead after six. <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay, Rebecca and Kaylin, what are your impressions of the wine? It's beautiful, mm -hmm. for starters. Um, when I initially picked up my glass, it had been sitting there still for quite some time. Um, my thought was maybe a hint of cinnamon or caramel, something along those lines. Um, but upon tasting it, um, I'm getting really deep, dark, rich fruit, um, but a lot of brown spice. Um, I can't quite narrow it down. Maybe it's um, anise, something maybe on the darker realm, maybe something a hint right. of um, more herbaceousness. Um, but it is very pleasant. I am enjoying it quite a bit. Mm, it is so, very tasty, I agree. Yes, I get all of those things. Um, I also get on the palate, actually, on the finish, I get a little bit of um, melty chocolate on the, on the palate, which I really like. Did you get into yeah. my chocolate stash? I did not. <laughs> but I'm telling you, this wine would go really, really well with it because I'm really getting that on the, kind of on the... I'd say maybe four or five, mm -hmm. um, that, that sort of melted chocolate. Um, and then I also get um, the, the darker fruit. Sorry, my dog just interrupted, Kaylin. Um, I get the darker fruit and I get a little bit of sort of black pepper on the nose. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to, to all of that 
dark sort of red plum and it, it really has a lot of depth to it for such a young wine. And I'm really excited to see how this ages because I think it will, I think it will age really, really well. Um, I, you know, right now I'm getting uh, just a very, very, very mild hint of eucalyptus and herbaceous yeah. wrapped in yeah. that herbaceousness that, uh, and there's a, a touch of citrus in there. You know, it's funny, every time I, I never smelled citrus in, in cabs until I started uh, drinking Stag's Leap District Cabernets uh, in oh. down in the central part of uh, Napa County. And it, it really just comes right out at you. And now I can actually smell it. So going back to the idea of training your palate, when you start to find something consistent in wine, try to find it in other wines, you know, that's you know, training your nose and your palate. Um, and yes, we do have lots of fun with terms. My favorite thing is, mm, I'm getting a, uh, uh, a little bit of wet saddle leather. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely burnt plum. You know, I love it when people start doing things like that. It cracks me up, but. The, the question is how did the saddle get wet, John? I, the and who in the hell tastes wet saddle leather? I don't want to know any more beyond that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, no wet saddle leather in this. <laughs> That's good to hear, John. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, food time. You guys were prepared for it, yes? <laughs> Besides wet saddle leather, what goes with Cabernet? <laughs> Margaret, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to pick on you for a little bit. Yes. Oh, no. uh, yeah. I, I think... Um, Definitely a filet. I'm, I'm going to go for the steak and rich and very tender. Um, I think red meat is what it's about here. I, I'm loving that with our, the third um, tasting that we have right now. I've mentioned cheese earlier. I don't you did. know. You did. I, I won't disagree with you with the filet. Um, but um, what something other than beef? Oh gosh! Let's put you on the spot. Really. Back it to my mom. Why you gotta? Why you gotta berate her, John? <laughs> I'm not berating her. What, what part of that was berating? I just think, in addition to the play, something other than beef. What? We I, I like know. to pick on Margaret. I know. I've <laughs> I've, noticed. <laughs> one of my favorite things is to tell people she's my fashion coordinator. <laughs> Don't listen to. Him. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know. John, if you just uh, just look over our shoulder right here, and you'll see what we're looking good. away. <laughs> Duck goes really well with good care. Oh. Yeah. Oh, it does. <clears throat> I, I think we may have stolen somebody's thunder, though, Doc. <laughs> there okay. you go, uh, Margaret. Thank you for letting me pick on you. Uh, okay. So, Doc, what about you with the prairie rotation? Well, what? Canard, canard, <laughs> canard. Okay. I, you know, I tell you, um, also a, a wonderful Chinese dish, you know, with uh, the, all the ways that they cook duck. But uh, uh, I think that that would go very well with this. It'd be fun to try it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, somebody just mentioned beef stock, so, um, which sounds very good. And another person, uh, Sam, just said they had pot roast with both the reds. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pot roast. Yes. Absolutely. Well. <clears throat> so um, all right, guys. Kaylin, Rebecca, food, food choices. Um, I will uh, say ditto at Margaret. Um, a filet would be beautiful. Um, but also I feel like I don't know, steak fajitas sound very good right now. And mm -hmm. so I think it'd be lovely with some steak fajitas. Okay. What about the other ones? The other wines, okay, so for the prairie roti, I think perhaps the shep a shepherd's pie would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds, tasting through it. And then with the, the 2018 Joe Lee, I was thinking um, perhaps a pork chop dish with um, like apples and cinnamon and all this beautiful stuff. My mom sent me a beautiful recipe the other day that I haven't gotten to try out yet, but I think it would work very well. Oh, that sounds lovely, okay. When are you cooking his dinner? Right? <laughs> nice and cool. We can hang out in the same space with no masks on, so it is yes. possible. 
It does. Oh, I have a great way to keep people wearing masks. You want to hear it? Mm -hmm. Always wear your mask. You don't want to. You don't want people going around thinking you're a vaccinated Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what? <laughs> I know. I'm going to get a lot of trouble for that one. I, I was too busy to mute, right? <laughs> you should just I give you plenty of warning. <laughs> you did. You did. You did. I, had to, yeah. I had to hear you. If you can't tease. Uh -oh. uh, no. <laughs> so what, what, are you, what are your food choices, Rebecca? So I... I... I agree with Doc about the duck for the cab because it's just glorious. Um, but uh, yeah. I also think that, that I think red meat goes with this and I'm trying to think of a different dish. So I think maybe a bacon wrapped filet mignon would be fantastic with this cab. Mm -hmm. Would be really, really great. Uh, with a prayer roti, I know I said Thanksgiving dinner for the Jolie, but that's usually kind of the sort of appetizer first course. Prairie Roti is the other wine. Those are the two wines that I always suggest to people for Thanksgiving. And Prairie Roti, I think would be great with that. The shepherd's pie, I think was on point. Um, and uh, yeah, for the Prairie Roti, it's the, the, the stuffing, you know, and, and all of the things with Thanksgiving dinner, I really enjoy with that. The Jolie, I was thinking actually what I had for dinner last night, which was um, lemon baked salmon with uh, roasted sweet potatoes and red onions and garlic. I thought it would be really, really good with the with the 18 Jolie. Well, oh, that, that does that sounds very, very good. <clears throat> We're available, whatever. That's what yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be <laughs> That is awesome. Well, I, I hope everybody knows that my little thing about the, the vaccine was a joke. Yeah. I got vaccinated personally because I was very excited that Bill Gates thought I was interesting enough to track. God, why are we really getting close to doing it, John? It's fine. <laughs> my Starbucks order with Rebecca. Oh, oh somebody, Jess just said fried chicken with the 18 Jolie. Ooh, that sounds so good. Oh, they said, ask John McCracken. Okay, I'm definitely asking him when I get back to work. Apparently, he's got the fried chicken connection. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, exactly. Why okay. hasn't he told us? Maybe we do that for lunch on Friday. Yeah. Before I say any more politically insensitive jokes, what do we have up online for next week and what's going on in the wine club? So next week... We're going to be trying all of the wines that were sent out to our White Wines Club. So that's going to be our 2017 Viognier. We're actually going to try the 18 Jolie again, because that was the new release we sent out. Then we, we snuck in a rosé to the White Wines Club for the first time ever, because I wanted them to have a new release. So mm -hmm. the, the 18 Jolie, the 17 Viognier, and also the 2014 Muscat Chenin, which again, just like that 2015 Prairie Roti, is another one where it's like, it's an older vintage of wine that just keeps doing so well. I mean, it just, it really, it ages really, really well. And I think it's important to see that a white wine ages really well, because a lot of people are like, oh, if it's not, you know, last year's harvest then i'm not going to drink it and i think those are all great examples of of different vintage years and and different wines and i think it's a lot of fun um so that's what's happening next week wine club we had our first uh wine club pickup party for the may shipment last sunday which was fabulous and everybody came out and we'll have our second wine club pickup party this coming sunday for the may shipment so we try to have two uh, for every shipment and those are going really well and everybody seems to be enjoying the pairings that we're doing with the wines, which is always nice. Uh, the poppies at the winery are hanging on. They're trying real hard yeah. to hang on. The multicolored uh, side is is still hanging on a little bit. The, the red poppies are pretty much gone at this point, but but the multicolor field is still hanging on. So, so the winery still looks beautiful and, and I'm excited for, you know, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll start doing some actual wine club member events again and start doing some of those, uh, you know, the sensory evaluations, John, and, and start kind of bringing people back out to do some of those. I'm, I'm really excited for that to start happening. So that'll that's be what's fun. Coming up. And, you know, the, the introvert in me, though, is 
uh, not been unhappy being in the cellar. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay, so what, um, so we've got the next, then the next two weeks are wine club tastings here, right? Okay, and so the next week is week 60, correct? Yeah, yes. and that's the white wines. And then the week after that is our red wines flight. And so that has another new release, the 2018 Gestate, which is one of those La Quattro Stagioni yes. series. So it's the newest um, release in that series uh, for our wine club member only wines. Now I, I do I do want to to shout out about the uh, specifically about the fourteen Muscat Shannon because I, I opened it and tasted it very recently, and I know some people don't get as excited about white wines as I think they should, for two reasons: one, white wines are very delicious overall; but two, they're much harder to make than red wines, much much more difficult to make than red wine actually, and three, that Muscat Shannon is powerhouse, mm -hmm. so. I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised if you take the risk and buy the pack. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised and far from disappointed. So uh, that's Thank great. Thank you. Yeah. So any final words, Doc, before we uh, send these no, folks, just, folks off? And um, I'm, I'm proud to be 60 weeks down the road with this terrible uh, curse that we've had uh, in COVID and glad to see the, the sky is starting to clear. And uh, we need to do everything we can to get them all the way clear. That's all I could say. Yeah. Well, I want to add my thanks um, to very close family, doctors and nurses who have been on the front lines in our family taking care of people and everybody else that we don't know. I, this, this wine is for you. <laughs> so cheers. They're here. Yeah, here. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you, guys. Thanks for allowing us in your homes this week. We'll see you next week. Okay.